Okay, so we're back here with Bart Smet. So Bart, you're working at the Cloud Programmability team at Reactive Extensions. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us, uh, very short, what exactly is Reactive Extensions? Okay, uh, so Reactive Extensions is a library, so it's yeah. not a change to the language or a change to the common language runtime or anything, um, to do composition of asynchronous computations. Um, so basically that means that if you have multiple asynchronous data sources, which we model as observable data collections, um, you can do basic operations between those. Um, and so that's where the word composition actually comes in the picture. Okay, and where can you use it? Can you use it on the phone, in the cloud? Yep. Uh, so there are a lot of things that require asynchronous programming today. Um, if you do UI programming, you're always doing asynchronous stuff because you have event handlers and all of that stuff set up. Um, so locally on, you know, typical client-side windows you can use it, you can use it in Silverlight, um, where you actually have to be asynchronous to do web service calls, like you can't do a synchronous blocking call in, in the world of Silverlight. And similarly on the phone, we, we run on Windows Phone 7, we're actually in the realm, so talking to things like sensors, accelerometers, all of that stuff is also exposed to iObservables, or can be you know modeled as iObservables. And then of course we have the cloud permeability team, so looking further we might actually do stuff in the cloud as well. Okay, so um, the reactive extensions as such has been available for some time now, I think mm -hmm. a few months? Um, yeah, well, yeah. it's almost coming up to a year, I think. A year, and yeah. so have you made progress? Mm -hmm. Are you still improving it or can you tell yeah. us something about improvements mm -hmm. yeah. in reactive extensions? Mm -hmm. So I think we've come to a point where the core changes we are making is adding more operators. So like a couple of months ago, or let's say half a year ago, um, we were still figuring out some of the fundamentals. Like the way to introduce concurrency was not done through the notion of a scheduler. So we introduced the iScheduler interface. Um, things like exception handling and error behavior was not formalized at that point. And so, so going on to Windows Phone 7 was a forcing function for us to make sure that we sort of nailed all of those you know, interesting things. And so we actually made sure that the exception handling behavior and all of that stuff is, is very rock solid. And so at this point, the additional value that we're doing is creating more operators that you could sort of see as business intelligence over data streams, for example, or um, operators that you know do things that you would have to do with like 15 other operators combined. But people tend to do all of that stuff quite regularly, so we introduce more operators. Um, and besides that, we're looking at bridging with the new async world and the async work that has been done by the language teams, like uh, C-Sharp 5 OVP 11, have introduced this notion of await. And so we're also looking into you know, how you would do large-scale asynchronous programming in this new world. So speaking about this new await feature mm -hmm. and asynchronous in C-Sharp, it will be native. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about uh, the differences and how they relate? Yep. Uh, so, so essentially the await keyword is, is a way to decompose your code into pieces. Um, like today if you do asynchronous programming, like downloading something from the internet, well, you have to split your code across multiple places. Like you first have the code before you do the asynchronous call, and then you get some callback to some other place in the code that's totally unrelated, and there your code continues to execute. So what the C-sharp await feature does is sort of turn everything into a sequential algorithm that you still see the code as it's intended to look, and the compiler does all those transformations for you. Um, now one thing is that the await feature, by default, if you will, sort of binds to task of t. Now, the compiler is not tied to task of t, it just happens that that's a typical thing that people do. Now, task of t is um, single valued. Like, you know, a task of t is, is a promise or a future that somewhere in the future you will have a single value available. And so if you await a task, you basically get the value out of the task and the code continues executing. Um, in the iObserver world, things are a little bit different. It's not about sequential data access. In some sense, it's about event-based processing. Like you have multiple values coming through. And so in that world, um, we've implemented a bridge with the await feature by just implementing the await pattern. It's again a method-based pattern that the compiler generates. 
In our world, when you wait an iObservable, you get back an iList of the values that are received before the completion of the event source. Um, and so single versus multi-value, you know, access to data is sort of different because like task of t is a single value and I observable is multiple values. Okay, thank you. So the the reactive extensions, mm -hmm. can you give some uh, real world examples? How can mm -hmm. they be used? Yep. Are they being used already? Oh yeah, there are lots of people, you know, if you look at the forums, it has gotten quite an uptake. Uh, so lots of people are using it. I would say 50% is looking at UI programming scenarios. And typically not UI programming by itself. Like typical UI programming you can do using regular .NET events. Um, as soon as you want to combine user input with, say, asynchronous web service calls, well, today the sum of the parts is not just the two parts. It's like, you know, lots of plumbing code that you have to inject there. Like, you get user input, you go to a web service, and then you have to cancel it out if there's new user input, and it just gets very messy. Um, so people use it for this kind of composition, where you have a local data source that's coming from the user and then you sort of compose it with, with data in the cloud and you're still asynchronous in that whole composition. So that's that's one of the core things of our X. Um, and besides that we also see quite some people looking at survey applications. Like you have HTTP handlers for example that can be done asynchronously. And so people are uh, doing quite some stuff in that, that world as well, like creating survey applications where something comes in and then a huge data processing pipeline starts pushing data through to all the operators ultimately to form a response to the user. And you might have lots of asynchronous requests that you're doing there in processing the end user result. And so um, I think it's you know applicable in all those domains. And you could envision much more like you know data sources in the cloud that are reactive and you subscribe to those, like what would be the default way to get like say stock tickers? Um, you would actually subscribe to that thing and just get the events coming out of the cloud at you. And it's a very natural model to do it this way. Like using task of t that wouldn't quite work. Because what the task of t would represent is a single stock ticker. Or it would be a task of t which contains an innumerable of all the stock tickets for a company for a whole day, but then you're too late to buy and purchase anyway. So, an eye observable is really about live data that's being, you know, sent at you periodically, and so that that's where eye um, observable comes in. Okay, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs>